Hi everyone, welcome to Casual Watch Talk. Well, this week we have another interview special for you and very kindly joined by, it's been a long friend to the show, Dave from Detroit Mint. So welcome to the show, Dave. Hey guys, thank you. Awesome. Well, let's, should we kick it off with a, a wristwatch check, a little bit of an icebreaker here. Chris, do you want to want to kick it off? What have you been wearing? Uh, swipped, uh, swipped, <laughs> swapped over to uh, wearing my Bell & Ross uh, GMT. Uh, I've got it on the bracelet right now um, for the, what did I say? Oh, the longest, shortest week that we just had. So... That uh, back to work, yeah, that back to work, that Tuesday that was like three Mondays worth of Tuesday. And so I just put on the, I put on the watch uh, that I needed to, to get work done for the week. So that's what I've been wearing. Awesome. And Dave, I'd love to know what have you been wearing? Is it is it one of your own or? Uh, today I've been wearing the new uh, Cobra Chronograph that uh, I got all the parts in. And uh, yeah, so everything came in. This is the first of the white versions to be fully assembled and ready to go. And you'll see from the back the uh, Seagull with the Swan Neck regulation and 100% regulated watches. So all regulated Assembled, almost all of them are assembled and ready to go. I'd love to find out more about that movement later. I'll finish this round off by I've been wearing my Omega X33. Finally got it back from the repair. So I owned it, for, anybody who's not been watching the show, I owned it for two days and then had to take it back to where I bought it from. They're very good uh, Orlando watch company. The alarm works now. And yeah, just getting used to it. It's weird because you think it would be a very high contrasting dial with the LCD. It even looks high contrasting on the video. But sometimes when you look at it, I don't know whether my eyes drawn to the LCD behind more. So I just it's just getting used to it, I think. But yeah, it's really interesting watch. I'll be doing a, a full video on it. I want to hear the sound off. Like I want I want a Breitling versus Omega alarm sound off <laughs> we will definitely do it i think the breitling has it i think the breitling called wake the dead that alarm <laughs> all right It'll be, that'll be interesting to, to hear <laughs> yeah it's full on it's not like your your casio flipping little yeah this thing is like wake up <laughs> it's, it's, that's great does it play an obnoxious song as well <laughs> no it doesn't but that that would be cool if it did or the uh yeah, the Omega one. So yeah, I'll I'll definitely do a, a, a sound off before and then I'll do a, a loom shot as well. But anyway, well, let's get to the main topic of the show. Dave, I'll do a bit of an intro here for you because many, many, well, a couple of years ago now, I did a video on another Detroit watch company. I found out a lot about them. Uh, so I made a video because there was, there was definitely some nefarious stuff going on at one time. But anyway, it was the Detroit brand that everyone knew. And I knew there must be other people from Detroit that were making watches. And I found two others, the Detroit watch company. And then I found yourself, Detroit Mint. And I think that's, I think I emailed you, asked whether I could review one of the watches. And since then, I've been had the pleasure of reviewing three of your watches. Uh, my favorite, the Bullhead, which we'll talk about shortly. But yeah, Dave, w welcome to the show. I'd love to know. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'd love to know. How did you get started in watches? Have you always? Yeah, I mean, even when I was a teenager, I loved watches. And my dad was a big collector of all things. He was a coin collector, a jewelry collector, and a watch collector. And um, he always used to talk about, you know, one day you'll inherit your great grandfather's gold watch. You know, that was a big topic of conversation. And when he passed, I inherited my great grandfather's. It was a pocket watch and it didn't work. It hadn't been serviced in forever. It was just something that had been passed down and it had always sat in a jewelry case somewhere. So I had it restored and actually used it a few times. And uh, it's now in my watch box. But um, and then when my dad passed away, he had a number of his watches from the Vietnam era that, uh, that I got. And um, he also had a lot of, he wore a Seiko on a, and I should have, I actually should be wearing that, but he wore a, a Seiko on a Native American watch cuff, one of the silver watch tips. I inherited a few of those from him and it, and a bunch of coins from him. And it got me into collecting those silver watch tips and watch cuffs and collecting silver jewelry in general. 
And uh, I was always getting these things with these old wind up watches in them. And they, ha they would have like an old Timex in it or you know, occasionally something a little nicer, a Benrus 5 or, you know, a three star or whatever. And um, there was some cool watches, but, you know, they were sitting on a watch cuff forever and they were in terrible condition. So my idea was I will make my own watch to go in to these vintage watch cuffs. Just got into it through dad's collection, led me into my own thing, started making my own watches. Um, the thought was with the cer certain ones, it was better to have a quartz watch in so you could get at the batteries. But if you're putting it into a full on cuff, like a Native American watch cuff is it's a solid chunk of silver. Trying to get one of those off to change a battery is almost impossible. So I was like, oh, I need an automatic. And that's where I found the, um, the 6105 automatics that you could get homages to the 6105 and just made up my own version of that. And then after I started making those, I was like, I really want it to look and feel more like a vintage watch than a modern recreation. So I changed the bezel, I changed the dial, I changed the uh, the bands that they came with were these cheap, crappy bands. Eventually created something that was the Islander that I think, Sam, you saw one of those. It evolved into what's now the Coretta Diver, which is Coretta is the scientific name for a sea turtle. So it became that watch. And then uh, one of my friends from Canada, his one of his good friends was looking at it and he was like, you know, Detroit, you should be doing racing chronographs. You should be focused on those. I actually like that idea. I like the concept. So we started making the switch, did the grand touring, okay sales on that. Wasn't great. And then I saw the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I was like, oh my God, what is that beautiful watch that he's wearing? It's so unique. The bullhead chronograph set about the quest to try to make one of those. and. Man, when that thing came out and after Sam, especially after you reviewed it, the sales on that took off and Detroit Mint became a pretty popular micro brand. I remember you first tried to do the, what you, the, the comment you made earlier about making the choice between quartz and mechanical. I remember the, that um, the Detroit Mint Mac, the, you, you made it in a mechanical first, didn't you? And it didn't quite take off. I actually reviewed that watch and I really liked it in mechanical. But I think the audience that watched the film, uh, the problem with those ones that were in the film is they were notoriously, well, you've actually got two of them, haven't you? They were notoriously yeah, not mechanical. two working so. and three not working. <laughs> yeah, they were very hard to find on eBay in working condition, weren't they? So I think when you came back with the Quartz version, I think that was that was just perfect for that watch. I think, um, I mean, I love the mechanical version, but I think the quartz version, the way that you laid the dial out and the, and you didn't go for the, the mecha quartz movement, did you? You put a, no. yeah, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a few, I actually bought a bunch of mecha quartz to try them and everything from like the Parnas Daytona to like a, the original Seiko's when Seiko first had a mecha quartz, you know, they don't even really hardly make a mecha quartz in any of their own watches anymore. Um, but yeah, I tried a bunch of them and I found the, um, if you had to take the crown in and out more than once or twice, it was prone to failure. And mm -hmm. if the crown was even slightly misaligned, um, it didn't work. And I was like, oh boy, that makes me nervous. You know, trying to, I'm going to be building these myself. And I don't know, it just made me nervous. I didn't like it. Yeah. And then I got some of the citizen um, their quartz, it's not really a mecha quartz, but it has like a, a fast flyback on its uh, reset. And uh, they worked great. They were really easy to work with. And I was like, oh, this is, this is great. This is simple. It's not a crazy expensive movement, super reliable. So we're talking. You, you mentioned uh shop. So you've got, uh, you've got a space there that you've been, been, putting stuff together for a couple of years now? Uh, yeah, so I built on the back of my house. Uh, I own an engineering and prototyping business. So I try to do a lot of the finishing work here in this, in my room that I have built on here. It's, uh, you know, some guys have like a, a small little, um, like a bedroom that they have set up to 
do their watch business in. And I have, um, let's see if I can do this a bit. Okay. Yeah. Nice little area. Yeah. It's a uh, nice little workshop area. You no, know, good size. Yeah. yeah. A good sized room. It's a couple hundred square feet. So, um, started this out as a, like a nice shop space for myself. And then, you know, I have all the tools and equipment and everything here to actually build watches myself. And uh, another storage room uh, for inventory. I have in the Metro Detroit area, quite a few shops that I can go to for machine goods, leather goods, denim goods, all that type of stuff. Um, so I've been slowly trying to get more and more of them involved in the process. It's it's interesting to calibrate our our listeners and our viewers to truly a micro brand. <laughs> you know, like that we throw that word around and we're like, oh yeah, they're a micro brand. But you're like, in no, you know, like Christopher Ward is no longer a micro brand. <laughs> they are they are giant. Um, and so we kind of have this tendency to throw that around. That you're definitely, you know, one. Uh, you know, the one watchmaker putting stuff together, you know, quality control, it all, it all goes through your hands, which is, uh, which is cool. Yeah. Like um, I'll give you a, for instance, if you want a, a gold <laughs> dial, <laughs> there, there's the gold dial with the, uh, and it comes like this. Right. And this is then going into a gold watch case. Right. But it comes out of a little box into my hands, into the case, the leather um, cuff bracelets that Sam and I talked about in, in depth of, of quite a while ago. Um, I'm putting those together from laser cut pieces that I had a, a company actually set up a, a laser profile to laser cut the leather so I could get it really exactly the same every time yeah i remember i sent you when i it was very important to me when i was reviewing that first mechanical one i'll leave a link down below that it had to for me it had to have that cuff so i got mccola over at man cave leather to he just mocked one up and made one for me i think i sent that over t to you to show you but it, it has to have a cuff that that it the once upon a uh, brad pitt's watching once upon a time in hollywood is so such a character in that film that I was obsessed with it. And obviously it sounds like a lot of other people have been obsessed with it. Is the gold the best seller out of that? Yeah, actually between yourself and um, Jody, both fell in love with the brushed gold. I think everybody wanted the polished gold because that's a more vintage look. But when people saw the brushed gold, it was a really deep brushing. It That's the one that people buy. And it it outsells all of my other watches probably that gold mock chronograph sells every week i sell a handful of those more than i sell all of my other watches combined wow i actually that one i was thankful that you uh, you let me keep the brush gold one i had a friend who was a neighbor in california he came over and saw it and he's not a watch guy but he fell in love with it so I, he now <laughs> wears it he loves it it he just something about because he'd been to i'd been to see the film with him and it was just something about the romance of the film that you managed to capture so well in the watch and also because it was quartz super reliable you didn't have to worry about those old citizen ones which they're a, they're an adventure to own one i understand from what you've been telling me now are either of you guys into vintage watches i know you have quite a collection of more modern watches i'm not really but I, yeah i think i i I dabbled a little bit into vintage Seiko. I did a little bit, but it's it's very fraught with danger. And so, you know, it's um I, I think that I, I think that a lot of people felt like they needed that like in their collection. Like maybe like two years ago, I think that was just like you needed a dive watch, you needed an everyday watch, you needed a beater watch, you needed a vintage Omega or you needed a you know, vintage watch, whatever it was. And um and yeah, I, I'm, 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 I went in a little bit of it, but stayed away and certainly, yeah, like I said, fraught with danger. So Dave, you're, you're quite into the vintage, aren't you? So I have, uh, I actually have collected, like I have a, um, you know, the, the citizens, uh, I have a vintage 
Seiko, six, a real 6105 from 1971. It was a birth year watch for me. I, you know, when I got my first big business deal in the late 90s, I bought a 94 Rolex. I have some cool old watches. I have my, like I said, I inherited some of my father's old watches. So I have a uh, Zodiac Seawolf, um, actually, you know, war worn Seawolf that came back with him from. Vietnam, 1967. So then I have a uh, his other watch is Seiko that he bought when he got home. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got quite a few actually. My new thing is with collectibles. I like to collect things that are um, were never meant to be collectible and have become collectible. Like ketchup packets. Yes. <laughs> Anything that was supposed to be just kind of a junk yeah. thing and then becomes collectible. Like uh, you know, baseball cards back in the 60s were something you got with a pack of gum, right? But if you get a 1960s baseball card, it's quite valuable. Well, I think in the 1970s and 80s, you know, we got those cheap, crappy little uh, digital watches. And they're making quite a comeback. They're becoming quite, quite popular now. So that's, that's my new thing I'm playing with now is the, are these vintage digital? Chris and I were joking, I think the other week about how the 90s has come back in fashion. And I can't remember the 90s being that fashionable. I think I lived through it and I don't think we thought we were fashionable at the time. Maybe we did. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe if I like, if I found like a restored uh, Motorola, the clear Motorola alphanumeric pager. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Be like... oh the clear pager, yes, with it lit up. <laughs> I, had the, I had the Swatch pager watch and yeah. and a co- That was high tech. It was, and that had a loud alarm. We were talking, we were joking about the <laughs> the uh, the Breitling having a loud alarm. That had a really loud alarm. But I f- and I found it a couple of years ago, and I it had it took the full CR two o two three battery, and I tried to pull the mechanism out to put the battery back in. The whole thing just fell to bits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's it, made of yeah, it's made of dust now. <laughs> it, it's yeah. Those uh, that's the shame about collecting those vintage Swatch watches that. I think the plastic at the time just failed if you didn't store it correctly. But and I've done some stuff with like old. I've done some restoration of old electronics. I I can't even imagine like getting into old watch electronics. That's you gotta. You probably have to find somebody. Yeah. So I had. That's funny you mention it. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna reach over here and grab one. A hard one to find, and certainly a hard one to fix. Oh yeah, yeah. An original, an original Pulsar, yeah. right? Yep. So that was in a Bond film, wasn't it? Did Roger Moore? It have was that in one? a Bond film. There's a side story to this watch too. Texas Instruments that created the chip for the clock. Well, they put that chip in other stuff. So, like, yes. there's a whole bunch of like YouTube guys that I follow that like are fixing up vintage or old uh, test equipment and things like that. And uh, this guy, Curious Mark, very famous YouTuber in that in right. that area. And uh, yeah, it was like talking about this chip that was in a on, an, on a board. And then he figured out that it was actually the same exact IC that's in that watch that's telling the right. like test equipment what time it is. <laughs> and and instead yeah. of um, instead of like sending it sort of like a special code or whatever in binary to like read the time. It is literally just like the computer is just pressing, like doing the button presses, like in logic. (laughs) Yeah. It's not like a solid state, actual movement of a mechanical piece. Yeah. So you mentioned bond watches. This is the other. This way. Oh yeah. Uh. Little uh, Roger Moore. uh, Yeah. This is the one that famously had the, Ticker tape pop out of it. Said 007, report to HQ immediately. M. Yeah. Well, and then there, of course there's that the TV watch, isn't there, from Octopussy? That's um, yeah. I, occasionally, I occasionally do a cheeky little look on eBay, and they're definitely creeping up in price. There's a guy on YouTube who's I'll leave a link to the video down below where he he managed to get a. a a transceiver to talk to it so he actually could film the video and put his own face on the he did oh, the intro to his YouTube wow. video yeah. on the Seiko watch. Oh wow. Phenomenal that he did it. Uh so he, he like broadcast it was like a short broadcast that he broadcast a TV signal to it 
Because I think right. wow, uh, local broadcast. That's cool. Let's talk about Dave. You came on as well for talking about your new collection as well. So you were telling me the other day that you've been really uh, interested in historical racing watches and and the time where most race drivers the watch was was pivotal to them time in their laps and things like that you know, i'm a big fan of movie watches and uh you know in ford versus ferrari uh carol shelby's character played by matt damon wears a white and black panda i believe it's one of the original hewer racing chronographs mm-hmm. it was before the carrera it was a hewer but what it was unique with it was that it had, instead of a tachymeter around the outside, it had one one hundredth of a minute. So you could time your lap times. Because when you're timing a lap time, you're not going to sit there and do a tachymeter calculation, right? You need to know that you ran that lap in four minutes and 32 one hundredths of a, of a minute, 4.32 minutes, right? So the watch actually had one one hundredth of a minute. Uh, markers around the outside i don't think i've seen that before exactly i had neither i'm like that's odd and unique so i found one of those cures and i didn't i couldn't find one to buy it but i found a a few pictures of it and i'm like that has a different old rallies because because math uh, doing math on paper is hard old rallies would do a hundredth of a minute so they wouldn't right. do they wouldn't do seconds they would do hundreds of a minute so they actually there's a bunch of modern clocks that will actually do hundreds of a minute still and so it's fascinating when you see them ticking away and you're like wait it's, it says 61 62 63 64 and you're like what is going on and it's ticking a little faster obviously um so right. yeah it shows off yeah how many in divisions so it has um as you fire off the, the chronograph it's um on the rehole ring or the chapter ring, whichever you prefer to call it, um, it's timing in one hundredth of a minute. So as you're doing your lap timing, it's doing that. And uh, I found it unique and I loved that, the look of that watch. And then I was like, okay, how can I make something very similar to that in a modern watch that would actually be reliable and not crazy expensive? You know, one of the more popular modern manual wine chronographs is the the Seagull, which is a beautiful movement. Uh, I found that. And then um, the challenge was, if I'm going to buy those, I worry about their accuracy and Mm -hmm. about the quality and reliability. You know, I've I've heard I've heard there's like four different companies that make them. And then the, the, and it's questionable whether you get one that's decent or, you know, who made the original one. Yes, the movement itself is a copy of a copy of a copy, but, you know, you, you still want to, you know, if you're going to be reselling them, you have to have some assurance that the one, the, the vendor that you're picking there. So, so V, I thought, so Siegel isn't one company. I know it's the old Venus movement originally, but I didn't know that, Chris. I thought they were all made by Siegel was the manufacturer. They're being made by a couple of different companies, from what I understand. Dave, maybe Dave knows more. So Seagull, as a brand, makes their own for the Seagull, um, you know, the, the Chinese army. The 69, 1969. Yeah, the, the 69. They make one, but then there's a bunch of ripoffs of that out there. And... There is a mechanical uh, chronograph that's a, it's called a Seagull 19 or something like that, but it's not actually made by Seagull. So you do have to get an actual Seagull and then you need to have them 100% um, checked and inspected to make sure that they're uh, keeping great time and everything when fully wound, they, you know, they're a hundred percent right on the money. Um, So all of mine go across the time grapher. They get checked prior to me getting, I inspect them again when I get them, you know, so it, you know, cause I'm getting them shipped in for, you know, the, the seagulls come in from China, citizens come in from uh, Japan. You know, to- I was just watching something that where people were saying that like, I mean, so that movement is, they're like, oh, well, you might not be able to service that movement. So maybe like a question of like serviceability, but also it's not, it's not that expensive of a mechanical movement as far as a chronograph is concerned. So. No. So you can, well, number one, if like a Detroit Mint watch, we service all of them are, you know, I service them myself. If you break one of these watches, part of our warranty is for the life of the watch, if it needs to be fixed or repaired or serviced, 
it's a $75 maximum charge. So, you know, you have 30 days to get the watch. And if you don't like it or buyer's remorse, whatever, send it back. No questions asked. 90 days, if you find something wrong with it, like, you know, something comes loose or whatever, any craftsmanship defect or anything like that, then you can return it. But then after that, it goes into its service life. And if you need it serviced or you want it repaired or something breaks, just send it back. And, you know, I have the parts for it here. I keep them in stocks. I can fix it myself. Or if it's not worth fixing, I'll just send you a new one and it's 75 bucks. You mentioned about that movement that it had a gooseneck regulation. Now, I thought that was a, is it the STP movements that Fossil make? They bought that company. I thought that was a company specific regulation system, but I'm interested to know about how it works and how do you find it? Gooseneck regulator is now offered from Seagull to anyone that wants to pay for it. But the only reason to pay for it is if you're actually going to regulate the watches. You know, you can just put it on there and slap it on there. It's just a, a means of easily adjusting. Like, it, you know, if you adjust the regulation on a watch, there's a, typically a little lever on the balance mm -hmm. bill. And you can move that up or down to try and slow it down or speed it up. But if you touch those things, um, it, it jumps a lot. Yeah, we've done, Chris and I have done videos on it. Yeah. yeah Big difference. Yeah. So with the gooseneck regulator, there's a screw and then there's a gooseneck, like a, a spring that goes onto that little, kind of pushes that little mark, micro, like a tenth of a millimeter with every turn. So it's very microscopic adjustment with the turn of a screwdriver. So all of my watches were regulated um, at the factory before they shipped them to me. So I know that every one of them is running perfectly prior to shipment. And then, of course, in shipment, they're, they're going to adjust a little. So you find it a lot easier to get that precise sort of regulation with them? Yeah, I mean, it's really precise. I mean, you can get them down to, you know, single digits for, you know, seconds per day of adjustment. I mean, it's, you know, they'll be within six seconds per day, four seconds a day. I mean, it's a mechanical watch, right? So it, it's, you still have to wind it every day. <laughs> and I'm amazed, I've just just flash up the the website for a second i'm amazed that your introductory price is 400 dollars for a mechanical chronograph um on currently on this is this is the pre-order price of course yeah so the like we we're talking the seagull movement even with the full regulation is still under a hundred dollars for me to buy the movement in massive quantities right and then you know the cases sapphire crystals you know these come with a a very nice leather band and with a milled clasp, you know, you get up there and uh, we have no overhead, right? It, it's me and a couple of people that help me sell stuff and, uh, you know, promotions that I do. It's, I, I don't have a ton of overhead, so I don't have to, my watch versus the Hamilton, you know, they make a very similar watch, it's a very similar watch. Uh, and I would also encourage people that, fell in love with the uh, the other detroit brand because they were that they have a love for detroit that there is other brands out there at re very reasonable prices from people that are also have an affinity for detroit yes and even you know our other brand in detroit the detroit watch company they make some very high-end luxury watches with high-end highly regulated swiss chronometer grade movements I mean, those things are stunning, but, you know, I, I don't sell watches to, you know, in the thousands of dollar range. I sell watches to, I always say, I sell watches to the mechanics, not the auto executives. Oh, that's good. That's <laughs> a little marketing there. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I like mine to be able to go out and do work with mine, you know, especially the mock, you know, I, I take mine out and I work on my car. I, you know, I work on my boat with that watch all the time. Look into the future now, are you going to be streamlining the entire collection to be racing inspired watches or are you going to have another go at the, the dive watch scene? So with the dive watches that I have, um, you know, I've, I've been looking at, you know, my love for these vintage watches, you know, my, my ugh, collection of racing watch books and, uh, you know, a man in his watch, you know, when I 
some of these books, <laughs> the classics. Um, what I've seen was the divers got in the 70s, got tweaked into being rally watches, right? The rally mm -hmm. divers of the 1970s were uh, a way for Seiko, for instance, to have a play on the popularity of the race car driving, uh, you know, the wide world of sports race car scene and the F1 scene. So I will be making a rally version of our dive watch, and then I will be doing an automatic version of the mock called the mechanic. There will be a full automatic version. Oh, right. So that one is taking a bit to develop because a fully automatic chronograph packed into a bullhead orientation is very thick. <laughs> yeah. When you move that thing over and have to place it above the lugs, you know, you think the crown has to be above the lug. That thing ends up being, you know, quite thick. So I've been, I talked to a bunch of movement manufacturers all over the globe trying to figure out something. And I was able to find a movement maker who could kind of adjust their movement to make a, I would say the movement similar to a, uh, like a 7750, 7750 clones that are out there. Uh, it had to be tweaked a little bit to get the orientation. And then I wanted two dials instead of three because I wanted it to be symmetrical. And all of the 775 zeros that I saw, they were all oriented the wrong direction. Right, yeah. They're like out to so, the left or, or one side. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> If I see a 24 hour subdial on a chronograph ever again, it, it just makes my skin crawl. So Dave, we have a number of, we've interviewed a number of micro brands and I talk to micro brand owners all the time. Some of them, a lot of them got a start on Kickstarter and some have some good success with that, but you necessarily didn't have a good, with the original Mac, the mechanical one, you tried it on Kickstarter. I think that was your first time, wasn't it? And it, it didn't go quite as I'd expected it to or you'd expected it to go. What was the story there? Yeah, so I think there was a couple of things about the Detroit Mint brand. We had used the Old English, which is kind of symbolic of Detroit. A lot of people in Detroit use the Old English text on our uh, things. and. Um, a lot of people hate it, <laughs> surprisingly. I didn't realize that. Uh, a lot of people associate it with more of a Latin gang thing than they do a Detroit thing. I had no idea about that. Um, so um, that was part of it. And then uh, I think in general, you don't see a lot of the homemade videos on Kickstarter anymore. They're all very polished, very professionally created promotional videos and I just didn't want to do that I was like here's the watch here's what it is this is why I did it this is why I love it why I think it's cool and some people jumped at it right away and other people were like I don't like that video I don't like the the, the text on the watch I you know why wouldn't you just for that amount of money why wouldn't you just buy an original citizen there was a lot of negative comments that came back and I was like, oh, wow. So this is, uh, the, you know, the, the feedback was pretty harsh. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to think about some of these things. You know, was, there's some legit feedback. So I took a step back and it didn't, you know, it didn't fly. It, it got about halfway to its target. And I was like, okay, well, if I could get that many people interested in the watch, but there were certain things about it that they didn't like. Could I generate enough pre-sales on my own website to get some cash flow? And then I ended up just financing it myself. You know, I own a few businesses, so I, I had the means to do that. Wouldn't recommend other people attempting that with a totally new watch that you're designing yourself because you can get yourself into some debt, you know, pretty quickly. But um yeah, so I ended up partially financing it myself and partially just starting my own website and getting my own um, pre-orders on my own website. And I do think that it's become more of a marketing ploy for uh, like bigger watchmakers. I 
I don't understand why they are doing Kickstarter other than it's just. Yeah, it's it, it's the it's the it's the captive audience of I have to I have to be a part of the I, fear of missing out captive audience for sure. Yeah, and plus it's a great market research tool, isn't it, to see whether a new mix of you know a new type of watch or a new style of watch is going to get traction because other than I guess making the prototype, it's probably a cheaper way than doing you know some kind of audience survey or and you get the money up front. <laughs> so you have all the money up front you basically your marketing your your development team is you know you can do a bunch of uh stretch goals that it'll change a bunch of little things whatever but yeah if if it flies on kickstarter then you can you can really turn it so it's interesting we're just coming to the end of the the global pandemic and we know that the pre-owned watch industry went absolutely insane how did it did it affect your business the last year i would say because of the pandemic i was actually able to pay my bills with my watch sales whereas in the auto industry you know i i get paid based on my the number of parts being sold well when they shut the factories down nobody was buying parts anymore so my income from my regular job went from you know a good monthly salary to zero but my sale of watches went from, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month to several thousand. Um, and it, it, went, it was 10 times more, actually. So last Christmas, you know, I, I mean, it was, it was crazy how many watches. I was building 60 watches a day for a while. That, that was my job. <laughs> well, then did you struggle... Did it have a knock-on effect that you struggled to get the parts, or had you had you sort of accounted for that? I had, luckily, I think I had sourced enough of these. I, I chose a movement that was easy to get, and I, I don't think a lot of people use the, the the OS, the Citizen OS movement. So I think there was a lot of them available. I bought a bunch of them, and then I bought a bunch more when I. Um, Shortly after your review came out and I saw the uptick and I knew Jody was doing a review and with his, you know, very, very large fan base and follower base, uh, I was expecting a lot. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get enough of the movements in, get enough of the watch heads in, in different variants and be able to put them together. And uh, yeah, I just, I planned ahead. I bought in significant volume going into December and I was able to get through December and through the first six months of this year. And uh, it, it, you know, it really, really took off from, I would say from fall of last year to spring of this year when the pandemic was in the, the worst part of the second wave, watch sales were spectacular. And as long as you've planned your inventory, I guess to Sam's point, as long as you've planned your inventory correctly, you could get it. But now the inventory is even more challenged now. So it's it's not been easy, like getting the parts for the Cobras. It was challenging. You know, it took a lot longer than it did years ago to do it. Mm. And you and you had set up for e-commerce because of your Kickstarter. So that kind of that was very fortunate. That worked out. Yeah. So we did, I actually developed my own website. I, I basically do everything myself. And then if I need help with sales or I need help with fixing something, I, I'll, I'll reach out to a professional in a specific industry, but I try to do everything myself first. So I designed my website. I do my packaging. I do all the quality inspections. I build the watches. So it's literally just me unless I need help with something. And then I reach out to somebody else. Um, yeah. So then I had the website set up and I had an eBay store that was actually successful from my days of selling the silver native American stuff and things. It was quite successful from that already. So yeah, then I added the, the website and that really took off. And then this year we're actually working on updating the website to something a little bit more, uh detroit themed and it'll be like a total revamp of the brand here shortly yeah sam, sam and i had mentioned uh kind of during during when it was all happening we we 
were thinking that uh, the you know the larger companies that weren't set up to do direct to consumer that weren't set up to do e-commerce uh, were really going to take a hit and it, and it does look like I mean I was looking at some numbers of the whole watch Swiss watch industry being down about like twenty percent um, and definitely uh, you know and definitely could anybody who was online and could do online direct to consumer sales and we guessed that micro brands would be would be okay so interesting direct feedback yeah. there. And I wonder if those guys, um, if they had seen from this pandemic situation, the value of doing direct to consumer sales mm -hmm. and marketing, where like Sam mentioned, Yemma does very well with direct to consumer marketing. But I do feel that at this point in time, maybe those, the AD, you know, do, having ADs doing all of your authorized dealers networks and being in malls and being all of that mm -hmm. type of stuff, these highly expensive jewelry stores selling your watches. I just don't know if there's a, a ton of future in, in some of that, in some brands. And yeah. And, and interesting as a guy from Detroit where the auto industry is literally set up like that. <laughs> and so direct to consumer sales for autos are, is are, they're like, shunned or you know very difficult to get around so it's and it's funny because i was just today i was at lunch in detroit and we were talking about the new electric vehicles and stuff that are coming out especially out of ford uh the guy i was having lunch with was a manager at ford and um we were speaking about what's ford going to do with all these dealerships when direct marketing starts happening right you start buying your car online you're not going to need to go to a dealership um, but what you are going to need to go to the dealership for is as you're driving down the highway from Detroit to Florida, you know, if I'm driving to Orlando, for instance, I will, uh, you're not going to have an electronic charging port at every, every stop, but I guarantee you there's a Ford dealer at every major city. Every town has a Ford dealership in it that you can pull over, charge your car, go in, grab a cup of coffee and look at the new model. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in finding out more about the new Cobra, I'll leave a link to the pre-order in the description down below. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we really appreciate you watching and listening, and we'll see you next time on Casual Watch Talk. Thanks, guys. Bye.